welcome. Thank you all for coming. A brief plug for the Falmouth Art Center. We are free and open to the public daily. Many of you know that. I recognize a lot of, a lot of friends of the Art Center here with us today. Um, we do have three new exhibits every month. And right now in our Herman Gallery, we have our annual juried photo show with 53 photos, most by local photographers, some from people around the country as well. In our Landrau Partan Gallery, we have Below the Surface, a fascinating collaboration between scientists at Woods Hole Oceanographic and local artists. And in our Seagull Gallery, we have the works of Mesha Noor, who is originally from Pakistan, and her work is inspired by her native Pakistan. And we have virtual art receptions every month uh, that you are all invited to where the artists talk about their works and those have been going very well. Those are always the second Monday of the month. So the next one is on June 14th and it will feature the artists from 21 in Truro. Um, our classes for adults and children are ongoing. Some are in Zoom, most are in person at this point painting, pottery, weaving, you name it. You can check them all out on our website for everything going on. And well, we're here tonight to hear a talk by Chris McCarthy, CEO of the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. I am really excited about our talk tonight. I can listen to anything about Provincetown for hours. It is so fascinating. And of course, as we all know, the art history of the town is so important to the art history of the 20th century. And then to have Chris here, who is such a wonderful speaker and uh, being at from the Provincetown Art Association and Museum, for any of you who have not made the trip out there, it is so well worth the trip. It takes about 75 minutes from Falmouth. I do it as often as I can. And that is really a treasure of Cape Cod, um, that museum. I hope you make it out there. And for some housekeeping tonight, the rules of the sandbox, as we say for Zoom, we welcome questions during the talk through the chat. You can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask a question. I'll monitor the chat and field the questions to Chris and then we'll open it up to questions at the end. Um, we ask that you mute yourself during the talk. That's just in case your dog starts barking or your phone starts ringing, that we don't all hear that. Um, we will, you do, you can toggle between speaker and gallery view. We will be showing a PowerPoint so that puts everyone on the speaker view. And without further ado, I wanted to introduce Chris McCarthy. She is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. She's had that job since 2001, so 20 years this June, she tells me. She is responsible for all artistic, administrative, fiscal, and strategic directions of the largest presenter of Cape Cod art by national, regional, and international artists. Since 1985, she has worked in numerous galleries and museums in New England. They include the Hunt Cavanaugh Gallery at Providence College, the Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven, Connecticut, the Erie Canal Museum in Syracuse, New York, and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, one of my favorite museums. She received a BA from Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island in 1989 and a master's from Syracuse University in 1992. She was an adjunct professor at Boston University's Metropolitan College and taught managing a visual arts organization for 12 years there. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. Wow, I'm tired listening to that. <laughs> Mostly about the 20 years. I still can't believe that it's been 20 years that I've been in Provincetown. It, it, it started out as um, me coming for an interview primarily because I just wanted to come to Provincetown for the weekend. I really had no intention of taking this job. It was a, a, a an email that a colleague had sent me and it was basically an eight page job description that said, you will do everything you will make hardly any money. Um, and she said, well, you should really apply for this. And I, this is when I was working at the Institute of Contemporary Art and we were planning the new building that's on the waterfront now. So I came to Provincetown in a suit. The only people that come to Provincetown in a suit are usually selling things or Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. And so I came 
in my suit and it was unbelievably hot in June. And I came into this building and there was no air conditioning at all. Um, and I was looking at people staring at me with clipboards in shorts and t-shirts and I didn't know what to expect. So my, my three hour interview while I was sweating to death turned into 20 years later, here I am. Um, but part of the interesting thing about my interview is that I really didn't know a lot about the history of the Provincetown art colony at all. I mean, I knew, I obviously I had a master's in art history. I studied art history. I knew the basics of American art history, but I didn't know about Provincetown art history. And it was a board member, a woman named Ruth Hebert, whose father had been the town doctor in Provincetown. And I stayed at her house and I walked into her house and saw a Carl Knaths, a Milton Avery, a Jim Forsberg, and the list went on and on. And apparently Dr. Hebert used to swap dental or doctor services for artwork and motels and jewelry and Captain Jack's Wharf because they owned that too. And she really taught me about art history in Provincetown and the story of the art colony. I ended up staying with her for three nights for my interview. And she really clued me into how important this, the legacy of Provincetown is. And then two weeks later, I packed my car. Actually, I didn't even have a car. I rented a car and came to Provincetown and, and here I am. I have a car now though. <laughs> so anyways, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of walk through the history of the art colony. I'm gonna point out some of the pertinent things that I believe have added to the importance of the legacy. Um, most of the images that we're gonna look at are from our permanent collection and our archive, which is very rich. And um, I will definitely talk to you about Pam itself how this institution has changed and how we actually, well, I will say survived the pandemic and what we're doing um, to move forward. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen so that you can kind of walk through with me, my PowerPoint um, called A Century of Creativity, even though it's longer than a century. Uh, but basically this will kind of hit the highlights and some of the hopefully some things that you don't know as well. And I was, I wanna thank Laura actually for inviting me to do this because now it's Provincetown and Falmouth just like this on the Zoom, um, which I is still not my favorite form of, of uh, communication, but it works for this kind of thing because I get to speak to all of you tonight. Um, but I told Laura earlier that one of the, the reasons I think that I still stay here, other than the fact that I live across the street from the beach is that I continue to learn every single day, new things, new artists, new people that were here watching. Uh, when you're here for 20 years, you actually see artists that that it came here 20 years ago and are cycling through showing in galleries, selling their work, exhibiting, teaching. I mean, I've really seen, you know, some people come and go, some people leave and come back, but once you get Provincetown in your blood, you you can't ever get it out. And I, and I really, really believe that. So we're gonna start um, with a brief history. So Provincetown actually was really an island and the only way you could get to Provincetown before Route 6 was, it was there was by boat. And in 1873, um, a railroad was, was installed so that tourists and artists and people could get to Provincetown. And you know, people ask me all the time, why, why do artists go to Provincetown? Why do they continue to go to Provincetown? And it's true, it's really the light in the landscape. And we're so grateful that President Kennedy created the National Seashore and protected 70% of Provincetown, which is unbuildable, thank, thank God. And, and you know, artists still come to look at this light. And when you live here year round, you see how the light changes and it's, it's, it's unbeatable, it's just beautiful. And it was also very inexpensive back then to come and stay and rent a studio for $50 a year. How about that for a studio? I don't think you can even buy a shingle in Provincetown for $50 anymore, but at any rate, it was always um, this place that beckoned creative people, and it and it still is. Um, most people associate the beginnings of the art colony with Charles Webster Hawthorne, who opened his Cape School of Art in 1899. Uh, prior to coming to Provincetown, uh, Hawthorne studied with William Merritt Chase in Shinnecock on Long Island. Uh, 
Chase had a, a similar model for a school, and I believe Hawthorne pretty much borrowed that model in terms of painting out of doors, which is painting in plein air. And we know that a lot of us offer plein air classes. And there's a great photo um, down here on the right of Hawthorne on um, a pier painting. And the, a lot of his, his students were women who came to study with him for the summer. And he would always wear his white flannels and a hat and um, he would move all around Provincetown and paint. We have some great black and white photographs of him doing this, but this tradition is what really started the art colony. And um, by 1915, he had as many as 90 students who were here studying with him um, and painting primarily in plein air. And this is a, a beautiful watercolor on the left. And that was actually featured in a show that we did in 2019 of of watercolors of Hawthorne Hoffman and Paul Resica, but we have quite a nice collection of, of Hawthorne's um, always greedy for more, but um, we I'll, you'll see some more examples as we, we go through. Uh, this is an example of a Hawthorne class on the beach in 1910 and during our centennial, which was in 2014, we actually did a number of activities where we recreated these actual plein air painting classes where we had a model with a parasol kind of dressed up with a big hat and um, had artists uh, paint her. But one of the things that we learned is that when you were nude modeling outdoors, which came a little bit later, the people in the front row, one of their jobs was to make sure that no flies got on the model. So that was one of your jobs while you were in the front row. So that's why most people preferred to be in the back, to tell you the truth. Um, this is another image of Hawthorne painting and the care, uh, the gentleman in the front is Houghton Cranford Smith, who was um, one of Hawthorne's studio assistants. I had never heard of Houghton Cranford Smith. In fact, I had not heard of many, many of the artists that had come to Provincetown and um, we didn't have any of his work in our collection, but I had seen pictures of him because he was very closely related to Hawthorne and to Ambrose Webster. And when we renovated this museum between 03 and 05. In 05, the Boston Globe reviewed the museum in the architecture section and there was a big picture. And a couple of days later, I got a call and I get a lot of these calls. You don't know me, but, and then you're not sure what to do with that. But this was actually, I'm glad I took it this day because this woman said to me, my father was Houghton Cranford Smith. You don't have anything in your collection because I haven't given you anything because I've been waiting for you to upgrade that dump. That is what she said. So anyways, a trip to New York and lots of conversations later, we ended up with a hundred of Houghton Cranford Smith's works in our collection. And what's interesting about his work is that he came specifically to Provincetown to study with Hawthorne and Webster, traveled to Bermuda with Webster, really um, took on white line woodblock printmaking. He was really, you know, doing plein air painting. And then he left the Cape and went to the Southwest. He went to Mexico, he went to the Midwest, he went to California, he went everywhere. Never came back to Provincetown again, yet in the seventies, he did two big paintings of Provincetown from memory. And so now we have this collection and it was because we upgraded our facility, which was really great. But I learned, and we all had his, we have his diaries and his, his scrapbooks as well from all of his travels, which now round out Houghton Cranford Smith's collection and his career at PAM. So that was one of those glad I answered the phone moments. Um, but like I said earlier, everyone associates the beginnings of the art colony with Charles Hawthorne. However, two years or three years before in 1896, a woman, of course, named Dewing Woodward actually opened the first art school in Provincetown for one summer. And this is a drawing that, or it's, it's actually a mixed media. It's, um, it's, it's uh, watercolor and graphite on paper that we, from 1896, that we acquired a few years ago when we discovered that Dewing Woodward had been in Provincetown before Hawthorne and had a school of art just for one summer. So I can see where Hawthorne could still be coined because his Cape School of Art in theory still continues, but Dewing Woodward did open one school for a summer and she was here with her partner. And um, we're hoping that we can find out more information about her as well. Webster, who I mentioned before, was uh, along with Hawthorne, was another founder of the Provincetown Art Association, and he had a school of painting, which was directed or was located directly across the street from Pam. It's now a private residence, but it used to be the flagship restaurant, which was owned by Nappy Van Derrick, and he was a pioneer of modernism 
wonderful approach to color. Um, Webster actually wrote a, a little booklet on the theory of color, but he was using colors like purples and yellows and oranges when, when artists were not using those colors. So he was very forward thinking. He did a lot of traveling to the Caribbean, to Bermuda. Uh, we actually have a series of some of his Bermuda paintings as well, but Webster was a very influential part of the art colony. And, and as I said, one of the original five artists founders of PAM. And that's New Hampshire winter that um, painting. So once these artists started coming and they were you know, here painting in the summers, they decided that they needed um, an organized institution. So in 1914, the Provincetown Art Association was founded. There were five artists, William Halsall, Oscar Giebrich, Garrett Benneker, Charles Hawthorne and Ambrose Webster were the five and some businessmen um, from Siemens Bank, who has been our 107 year partner, um, and some other businesses decided to establish this, this organization. And they showed their first several years of exhibitions were shown at the town hall in Provincetown. And this is one of the reasons why the town of Provincetown has such a really amazing collection because these artists wanted to start building a collection and they gifted them to the town of Provincetown. Now there's always some controversy about what belongs to the town and what belongs to Pam. So if you go into town hall and you see that giant Hawthorne, the, uh, the crew of the Philomena Manta, which is one of the most famous paintings in the town, it says on the back property of the Provincetown Art Association and Museum or Provincetown Art Association, but it's part of the town's collection. I'm not, after building this building, I'm not quite ready to fight with the town yet. I have to muster up the energy to, to get that out of there, but we'll see. We do borrow it occasionally. At any rate, this is where they were showing and it, the organization got too big. And so the town said, you, have, you can't show here anymore. You have too many artists. We don't have enough space. And so um, in 1918 is when we purchased 460 Commercial Street. But on August 27th in 1916, the Boston Globe read, biggest art colony in the world at Provincetown. More than 300 artists and students were in town 25 year round and six schools of art were in operation. Now this is in 1916. So you can imagine the draw to come here. And a lot of it was by word of mouth. And a lot of artists were coming from New York. They were coming from um, Paris. They were coming from all over. And in, like I said, in 1918, 19, we purchased 460 Commercial Street. This was purchased for $5,000, this space. It was the sea captain's house and another structure, which had been a tenement house at the time. And when we did our construction here and we excavated underground, you have no idea how many booze bottles we found under there. I was like, I'll take the bottles and we found no bodies, thank God, because I was a little worried about that. Um, but at any rate, um, we were able to, uh, they were able to purchase this, this, um, this structure and they started to do some renovations on it, adding galleries in the 30s and the 50s and the 70s. And then basically no work was done on the building after 1970, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is a great photograph of the Beachcombers who their little club is located directly across the street from Pam. They were founded in 1915, the year after, and this was a welcome in 1919 to the new spot um, on uh, 460 Commercial Street. And um, we actually did a really nice show of the Beachcombers um, a few years ago, uh, really interesting history as well. And I do get to go in the club every once in a while. Women are not allowed, but I get to go in every once in a while because we're, we're good neighbors. Um, and so as the story goes on, poets, novelists, playwrights start coming to Provincetown. The Mary Heaton Vorse House, which is located two doors away from Pam, was recently purchased and renovated back to, well, it was restored back to its original state. And the house is now functioning in the way that Mary Heaton Vorse intended for gatherings, for conversations, for films. Um, and so Pam is now a program partner with the Mary Heaton Vorse house. And somewhere in our archive, we have a cocktail napkin that has a picture of our backyard with a little parcel of land that Mary Heaton Vorse sold to the Art Association in the 50s so that we could build the Hoffman Gallery. And it was kind of a handshake deal, but it's on a cocktail napkin. You gotta love, you gotta love that kind of negotiating. So we've had a long history with Mary Heaton Vorse, Pam has, and so now we're rekindling our relationship. But she was one of the um, initiators of the Provincetown players. Eugene O'Neill was here. 
um, break, his breakthrough drama Bounties for Cardiff was first staged in Provincetown, Tennessee. Williams was here and the list goes on and on. Billie Holiday, musicians, writers, actors, they were all coming to Provincetown. So it was really this bohemian um, de destination. And, and, you know, a lot of people, they would say would come to Provincetown if they were running from the law or running from something. But one something I never understood is once you get here, you can't go any further unless you're going to get picked up by a boat. So I never understood the whole running from the, well, I can understand running from the law, but I would think that you might get caught here. Who knows? So in 1915, and that date is debatable um, about the formation of the Provincetown print, which is the white line woodblock print. And that's a technique that was perfected in Provincetown. Some say 1914, some say 1915, depending on who you talk to. But this method itself was creating a print out of a single block as opposed to multi-block techniques, which were Japanese techniques. And I probably easier to show you. So this is BJ O. Nordfeld, who was one of the original Provincetown printmakers. And on the left is a print that was done with a multi-block process so that each color had its own block. This on the right, however, our fisherman, is a single block. So it's essentially a block of wood that's carved and you have to carve it backwards. So for people who can do that, my brain, I don't think could do that but you're basically inking the block and then you register the paper and where you see the white lines is the groove in the block. And the more you register the block, the more saturated the block becomes with color and they become more beautiful in the artwork in some instances, but we still teach this in our school today. Um, it's a technique that's very unique and intricate. And if you've ever watched someone make a white line woodblock print, that's really the only way I understood it was to actually watch someone do it. They're actually spectacular and beautiful. And if you come to Pam soon, um, we have part of the Nappy and Helen Van Derrick collection up at Pam and Nappy, who was a restaurateur and a very, very important collector and character of Provincetown has had an extensive collection of white line wood block prints that we're hopefully in the process of gifting to Pam. Um, but they're really quite beautiful and we have a few of them up right now. Uh, one of the other amazing Provincetown artists who is in the genre of the white line wood block print is Blanche Lazelle. This is actually a drawing that she did, which was a study for a, a, a block print. And what she would do is put the colors like green and red and orange where she was gonna, um, ink the blocks once she created it. This piece on the left is, is a pair with another piece that was actually purchased at the at a, a flea market on the back of a van marked down for second day sale. So two, two block prints for 60 bucks. These block prints each go for more like $80,000 a piece now, as opposed to $60. And when I started in 2001, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston had just launched their exhibition, Blanche Lazelle from Paris to Provincetown. That was the name of the exhibition. We supplied an exorbitant amount of information, archival information, but we couldn't take that show because this is prior to Pam doing its renovation. So everyone was like, why is that show not coming to Provincetown? Why is it in Boston? And that was a real interesting question one that really spurred us to get it together and do a renovation on this building because the Albright Knox Museum launched a giant uh, exhibition of Edwin Dickinson in Provincetown and Pam couldn't take it. So I think that was really one of the catalysts to think about building or rebuilding a space that could accommodate work from other museums, climate control, security, et cetera. And we'll get more to that in a little bit, but, but Blanche Lazelle is a perfect example of an artist who came to study with Hawthorne. She worked in the white line woodblock print vein. She also studied with Hans Hoffman. And this painting, painting number 12 is probably one of our most important Cubist paintings by Blanche Lazelle in the collection. The interesting thing is that Blanche was actually very hard of hearing. And so when she took classes with Hoffman, he had a very strong German dialect. So he would write phonetically in the margins of the drawings. And we did an exhibition of those drawings one year where you could actually see him writing um, to explain to her what he wanted her to do, which was really quite interesting. The West Virginia University owns that collection of drawings, but I think we still have the catalog at PAM. So then we move into modernism. And, and the thing I always say about Provincetown, it hits all the isms. You go from impressionism to post-impressionism to abstract expressionism to modernism, and it goes on and on and on. But the Armory Show of 1913 really introduced modernism to the American public. And it made 
a lot of people uncomfortable, including the Provincetown Art Association. Up until 1927, the Provincetown Art Association had consistently had exhibitions of tr more traditional painters like Hawthorne. But when Hoffman moved in and the abst abstract expressionists started moving into, into Provincetown, the, the traditional painters refused to show in the same space. So there was a 10 year rift between 1927 and 1937, where the Art Association had to have two separate shows a year because they wouldn't show together, the, the traditional painters would not show in the same space as abstract expressionist painters. And that story plays into the design of Pam, but when we come to that, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. But Ross Moffat, who was an incredible artist, he came here from Iowa. Moffat was a vice president of Pam, he was very involved. He was one of those bridge artists he and Todd Lindenmuth and a couple other artists put together a petition to end this rift so that artists would show in the same spaces together, qualifying it with that we're all looking at the same landscape, but because you paint it different than I do, it's still okay. And he was really one of these bridge artists that incorporated traditional and modern painting together. And we have a really incredible collection of Moffats. I think we have 160 Moffats in our collection um, that we, I think we have the largest collection of Moffat's within a collection and he was basically under recognized but an incredible painter and we have some really really nice ones up right now. Carl Canass was another one of these artists that started um, painted more traditionally moved to more abstract he also was a block printmaker as well and he was married to Agnes Weinrich who was also a modernist um, uh, printmaker and painter. Henry Henschey who was a student of Hawthorne carried on the tradition of Hawthorne's Cape School of Art. Hawthorne died in 1930. Hence, she didn't take over the school until 1932, and he insisted on changing the name from the Cape School of Art to the Cape Cod School of Art. Marion Hawthorne, who was Charles's wife, didn't want him to change the name, so it took them two years to work out the details where Henshi would essentially take over the school, and he taught for 55 years um, continuing plein air demonstrations and other Hawthorne traditions. And that's a picture of Henshi on the beach. And that school still continues today under, I believe, the directorship of Hilda Neely, who was a student of Henry Henshi. So again, you can see how the traditions just continue and continue. And we're so lucky that we still have these students of, of these teachers that continue today, both from, Haw from Hawthorne and Hoffman. This is an example of a Henshi that's in our collection. This was a, actually a piece that was recently cleaned and this is the clean picture of it. Um, Hoffman, as I said, opened his school of, summer school of art in 1935 in Provincetown. He had been teaching in New York um, as well, but he taught and painted for 30 years here. And his original studio, believe it or not, was the Hawthorne Barn. That's where he, he first taught. And he went back to New York and while he was gone, I believe it was, um, Byron Brown or another artist kind of snatched it out from underneath them. And that's where he, when he built his studio on Nickerson street, which is still intact today. In fact, a few years ago, we actually did a studio tour and we took about 15 people to see the Hoffman studio, the Hawthorne barn, uh, the Hopper house. And we're hoping once things go back to norm, more normal, I guess we're going to try to do that program again, because we brought in students who had actually studied in these spaces to talk about their experiences being in the studio with Hans Hoffman and his initials are still engraved in one of the beams and there's still paint kind of splattered all about. So luckily the, the caretakers and owners of this studio have um, kept it intact. But Hoffman really, um, really hit raised the bar in terms of abstract expressionist painting in Provincetown. One of the worst stories of that I, I will still tell you is that apparently in the 60s, before Hoffman died, he offered his, a large collection of Hoffman paintings to the Provincetown Art Association, and they said no because they said they couldn't afford the insurance. Now, every time I hear that story, it makes me cringe. And two years ago, the Peabody Essex Museum took that collection, which eventually went to Berkeley College, and I could barely go see it because those were the paintings that should have been here. So it's been very difficult for us to try to build a collection of, of major Hoffman paintings in, this, in at Pam because most of them, the Provincetown ones went to Berkeley. Ugh, never make that mistake again. Um, this is actually a landscape that we just got to the collection in 2018. It was one of the first landscapes he did in Provincetown in 1935. And this was in a private collection in Boston. And uh, one of my 
really dear friends was in this home and sent me a picture of it on their iPhone. Is this a Hoffman? I was like, yes. And we need to get it. I said, just take it off the wall. He's like, but I'm in an Uber. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just get it. No. But long story short is we worked with the, the donors to gift this back to Pam, which was a really, really important piece um, within our collection. It's just, and it's absolutely beautiful too. Um, so in the 30s and 40s and 50s, a lot was happening in Provincetown. The Works Process Admi Progress Administration was providing some support for artists. Um, this is when Robert Motherwell arrived in Provincetown. And uh, the 40s and 50s were a time when uh, artists were, were coming together and, and having very heated discussions. Form 49 was, uh, was, was organized by an artist named Weldon Keys, and they did programs all over Provincetown debating artwork, debating different uh, movements within the art world. And it was a very vibrant time. This is when Franz Klein and Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner and Fritz Boltman were all here studying with Hoffman in addition, in, in addition to Helen Frankenthaler, who was here for a decade while she was married to Robert Motherwell. And Motherwell and Frankenthaler are two exhibitions. Motherwell we did in 2012 and Frankenthaler we did in 2018. Two exhibitions that had never been done at PAM before and were really, uh, I would say more on the blockbuster um, genre, but took five to seven years to organize those exhibitions. We even had to enlar enlarge one of our openings in order to get the Frankenthalers in the door. But what's great about those exhibitions is that it was work that was created here that was brought back here. And that was one of the big pushes to renovate this building as well is that do you want what was made here to stay here and do you want what's already left to be able to come back and that was the one question that everybody could have an, a yes to and everything else forget it so here's an example of a beautiful fritz boltman collage on the left and a franz klein painting on the right which are both in the collection um, in 1964 pam celebrated its golden anniversary and this is an image of what the museum looked like basically up until the renovation. The Charles Hawthorne Gallery here is a cinder block gallery. It had no windows or anything. And these hedges were probably about this high. And it basically the, said the message was, don't come in. We don't want you in here. Stay out. But the captain's house remained. And this is basically what it looked like up until 2001. But it was still a vibrant, vibrant organization. It's the organization was always strong. It just needed a facility to back up what the mission really was trying to do, and that's and that's what we did. Um, in 1958, the Chrysler Museum opened in Provincetown. That's where our our li our library currently is. It was also the um, it became the Heritage Museum. And then it now belongs to our library, which is an absolutely beautiful building. And again, because it's a municipal building, there's beautiful artwork in there. The Fine Arts Work Center was founded in 1968. It's spun out of PAM. We've been program partners with them for the beginning. And there were a lot of co-op galleries. And it was, again, a, a very vibrant time in Provincetown. Um, in 1999, that was the centennial of, of Provincetown as an art colony. I know that the Provincetown Art Association did a big Hawthorne exhibition in 1999. Um, at the time in 1999, there were about 12 other nonprofits in Provincetown. Now there's probably about 25 nonprofits in Provincetown, but we more than ever try to collaborate and work together, uh, pool our resources instead of trying to compete because that's been very, very difficult, especially in the last year. But it's interesting what you can see in a three square mile town, how much culture is, is packed into this, in this town. I think there's probably about 60 galleries right now showing some really great artwork, but you know, we're never at a lack to see anything. And we're so lucky now that our theater is able to do outdoor programming now, and there will be plays this summer and some performances. A lot of us have shifted to online classes and outdoor classes, which we'll continue to do. And then hopefully we'll be able to get people back in the building soon. So this was the new PAM. Well, it's not really new anymore, but what we basically did from that other picture is we renovated our captain's house and we knocked down the cinder block and we replaced it with a, a wing that had more gallery space, more um, storage space and more classroom space. So we essentially doubled the square footage of this building. Now, full disclosure, me coming from Boston, working on a $60 million museum project, I thought this was gonna be a piece of cake. Ha, 
boy, no one gave me the manual on small town politics. I can tell you that. Um, when you have a last name like McCarthy, dealing with South Boston politicians is very easy. You just go and tell them that you're going to create jobs, that you're going to do stuff with kids, and you're not going to show Maplethorpe ever again. And that's how you get your permit to build a new ICA. One meeting. That was it. I come to Provincetown, the oldest continuous art colony in America. We're about to renovate the art museum that protects that legacy. 21 times I had to go to try to get my permits because people were vehemently opposed to this design, which goes back to my story about linking something traditional with something modern, even though every material, cement, wood, and glass is cement, wood, and glass, same materials, just looks different. People were furious about the design of this building. We hired Machado and Silvetti out of Boston, who have both had home, had, had a home in Wellfleet for almost 50 years, both heads of the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, all the, all the accolades you can imagine, people weren't having it. They wanted me to hire someone local to build this. There were no local choices, needless to say. And I'm really glad I hired them because we are the first green art museum in the entire country where we operate um, when fully on uh, renewable energy. We do have backup systems, but we operate on solar um, and uh, a daylight dimming system and a, a fresh air ventilation system. So we are a silver lead certified building, which was something that wasn't planned at the outset of this renovation. We've won seven awards for merit design and sustainability, and we're seen as a model small museum for, for green buildings around the country. But the idea with this building was to, the natural light comes in through these skylights also here, but, but having a, a 24 hour access with the facade. So whether you walk by or drive by, you can always see something in the window because remember the before this was cinder block. And I can tell you, there is no architectural significance to cinder blocks. I had many, many battles about that. And I can tell you that I'm, I'm right. But at any rate, once this building kind of came to be and people got over the outside and actually saw what could happen inside, it made a whole world of difference. So we essentially have 6,000 square feet of gallery space downstairs. We have 4,500 square feet of, of storage space underground. We have 4,000 square feet of studio space upstairs in addition to office space and three outdoor sculpture gardens. So we used every ounce of space we could. Um, still can't, didn't solve the parking problem, but I can't do that too. Uh, at any rate, this was one of the installations that we did when we opened this wing, because the interesting part of this renovation, another part, is that we never closed Pam when we did this. We would we knock when we did one wing. We you artists our artist members were still showing in the other side, and we did murals on the walls and we did everything we could to main to keep people engaged and try to maintain and have them watch this process unfold. But this was an artist named Catherine Widgery who collected things, all kinds of things. And this was this giant tornado of things all the way down to a little bee at the bottom, a bumblebee at the bottom. It was color coordinated and it would kind of sway back and forth. And when people walked into this, they didn't know what to say. They couldn't believe it. Like some people hated it. Some people came and saw it every single day. But the idea is that it made people think about these were all things found on Cape Cod. And we know how people go, you know, beach combing for this, but this is the ultimate beach combing uh, installation and it took three weeks to install this. Everything is suspended by fishing wire and it took about 25 people to help with assist with the hanging of this, but it was brilliant and it was really cool because when you first came in, there was a really historical show, then there was an abstract expression show and then there was this. And what we really tried to do was showcase what we do at PAM. We are not only a historic institution that preserves a legacy, we are not just an art association that showcases artworks from our living contemporary artists on Cape Cod, but we're a museum too that houses a collection. And we really try to showcase the three pieces of PAM through education, exhibitions, and collections through the shows. And so it was, uh, I, again, I got a lot of heat for this, but I didn't care because I thought it was fantastic. This artist was great to work with. She lived on the Cape at the time but it really opened eyes to what we could do in these, in these spaces. 
um, our school, this is one of our studios. And when I see these, these are like this installation shots that we took when it was brand new. I mean, look at the floor. It looks like a skating rink. Doesn't look like that anymore, but that's okay. Um, but this is one of our, 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 our life drawing classes. All of our studios have natural light that comes in through the North. And even on gray days, the light is fantastic. And in the old ice, uh, Pam, we had one little dingy classroom and there was like a dirty window that let no light in. No teachers ever wanted to teach with us. Now we have over a hundred teachers that teach with us on an annual basis in beautiful spaces. And it does make a difference when you have a nice space. It didn't make the museum great. It just gave us the opportunity to do better work. And um, I love these spaces. What One of the great things about working with Machado and Silvetti is that we, they actually listened to what we had to say. We had a building committee and we talked to artists at RISD and other, other colleges and art schools about classrooms and we really did our homework on this to try to build something that really worked and it and it does it really really works and they're they're really wonderful spaces and hopefully we'll have students back in those soon um this is one of the galleries that's the hoffman gallery this is the the one we bought from mary heaton boris the land back in the 50s that this pretty much stayed the same has that big airplane hangar feel but this is a when you go into the front of the building, this 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 gallery is very deceiving from the back because you you don't realize how big it is. But it's a wonderful, wonderful gallery. And then what we have on view right now in our spaces is, as I mentioned, we have the Nappy and Helen Van Derrick collection. So for those of you who don't know who Nappy Van Derrick was, he owned Nappy's restaurant in Provincetown. He grew up in Provincetown. His father was a past director of the Provincetown Art Association, but he amassed the most incredible collection of early Provincetown art with an eye on women artists and under-recognized artists. And we are now in the process of working to acquire um, the majority of that collection. We have 125 pieces at PAM right now. We did part one during the pandemic and we have part two and three up right now. And they are basically, as Nappy said, the way it used to was. So essentially it's images of Provincetown the way it used to look. And he would have paintings of the same view by 10 different artists or 20 different artists. And we've borrowed from Nappy's collection for many, many years. But the idea of having this collection fills in incredible gaps in ours. We have about 4,000 objects in our collection right now, spans the late 1800s to the present. But there are a lot of missing links within this collection. And this so helps that, especially on the historic side. So if you haven't seen this show, it, it, it's so worth it. You want to talk about a walk down memory lane. It really, some of them, you feel like you can really walk right into the paintings themselves. Um, like I said, the Hoffman Gallery, it's a really big gallery. So we did a show of really large works. Um, there were only 13 pieces in the exhibition. But when you can put really big paintings in a really big space, they just look fantastic. And this was one of my COVID projects. Um, I'm sure my installers weren't happy about this, but it, it was just, it's magnificent to walk in a big space and be in front of really giant paintings, all from the permanent collection. What we really did during coronavirus is we had to cancel a lot of our exhibitions, especially the ones that we borrow from other places. So we um, really utilized our local resources, our collections, um, local collections, but mostly we pulled from our own, which was really actually a lot of fun. Um, like I said, our permanent collection uh, started with gifts from the original founders. I would say that 98% of our collection is gifted to us. We have um, a small acquisitions fund where we've been able to purchase some things that come up, but this is a Charles Hawthorne on the left, the boy with fish, and this is Roth, Ross Moffat's Backstreet Provincetown, which is a spectacular painting. And um, each year we do a consignment auction, we've been doing it for 30 years now, of deceased Provincetown artists, and a lot of times people will buy these paintings and hang on to them a bit and gift them back to us. So that's a way that we've really built this collection. When I started, we had about 900 and something works in the collection and now we're over 4,000. So it's quadrupled, which means so does your storage space. So that was one of the, another reason why we had to build the, rebuild the building was to have storage space, but we also have some offsite storage in Truro as well for some very, very large, large things, but um, wonderful collection. And it really tells the history of this place like nothing else. Um, we also do members exhibitions. As I mentioned before, we do juried and open shows. So there are about, if you're a member of PAM, there are about four to five opportunities a year to show. This is um, one of our jurors who works at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, she was, this was our centennial juried show that she was looking at trying to make sense of 300 things. 
to put together in an exhibition. I do try to ask jurors from over the bridge because if you are local and you don't pick your friends, you could easily get accosted in the stop and shop. So we don't want to do that to our jurors. We hope we, but we have brought jurors in from museums all over the country and it's really um, an exciting process. Um, the recent gifts. So each year we do a show of recent gifts, but one of our major recent gifts was in 2016 when we acquired our collection of Edward and Joe Hopper drawings and ephemera. When I started here in 2001, we had one landscape by Josephine Hopper of, of California. And so people would always come in, where do you have any hoppers? And we'd say, yes, we have a, a, a landscape by Joe Hopper. And you can imagine the disappointment factor was pretty great. And then in 2014 for our centennial, we got two drawings by, by Edward Hopper, a male nude and a female nude. And again, the disappointment factor was still pretty evident. And then in 2016, the Schiffenhaus family who had acquired this collection uh, made a deal with us and we were able to purchase this collection of Hopper drawings. And the story is, is, is just incredible. Um, the Larry and um, Anton Schiffenhaus are two brothers and their mother, Mary, lived in New Jersey and she came to Truro with her neighbors after she had gotten a divorce in the 30s. So she came to Truro and she stayed with her friends and they were neighbors to the Hoppers. So Mary Schiffenhaus became friendly-ish with Joe Hopper. I wouldn't say they were best girlfriends, but they were definitely friends. And when Joe Hopper died in 1968, her will, which we actually have a copy of, was very clear cut. The artwork goes to the Whitney, the Nyack House, which was Edward Hopper's uh, child house, would become a museum. And the Truro House and its contents would go to Mary Schiffenhaus. So Mary Schiffenhaus, who was, like I said, a, a, not a great friend of, of Joe Hopper's, inherits this house. Unfortunately, Mary Schiffenhaus died in 1970 or 71, so she really didn't even get to enjoy the house. And her two sons inherited it. So they decided to do some work on the Hopper House. And they called... They talked to an architect who talked to a builder who talked to a clean it out, clean, clean up your house guy who came to clean out the house and found boxes of these drawings in the attic of the Hopper house, hundreds of them and the diaries and letters and all kinds of stuff. And because the will said the house and its contents, they didn't have to give the work to the Whitney. So this collection stayed together since the seventies. It was exhibited infrequently and then ended up in storage unit in New Jersey. So in 1996, the entire collection came to Pam in addition to these beautiful diaries that are not about Edward Hopper painting Nighthawks. It was about their very dysfunctional marriage. So I'm gonna, we're gonna publish them at some point, but I wanna do a panel with a psychiatrist, a divorce attorney, and somebody else, because these are like reading a soap opera. And when we, luckily the majority of them have been transcribed because Joe's writing is, will give you a migraine trying to read it, but I couldn't stop reading them. Every I'd lock myself in my office and start reading these stories and they were unbelievable about their, their marriage. And, you know, sometimes he was nice to her. He usually wasn't nice to her, but then they, she, she always coined herself as a, as a very important artist, especially a watercolorist. She claims that she showed him how to make watercolors, but he never gave her any kind of anything. And the story unfolds and unfolds, but at any rate, what's happened with these drawings is that first of all, so many people didn't even know they existed. Curators, scholars, art historians were busting down the doors to look at this collection because many of these are sketches from some of the major paintings that Hopper did because he actually didn't do that many. And he did a lot of sketching while he was on Cape Cod and then would go back to New York. And so um, a couple of like three or four years ago, two curators from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts called me and they said, Oh, we heard you got all those hoppers. Can you send us pictures of all of them? I said, no, they're all up on the walls right now. Get on a plane, come to Cape Cod, and I will show you all the drawings. So they did. And sure enough, there were nine drawings in this collection that were studies for paintings that they were going to include in their exhibition, Hopper in the American Hotel Room, which was in Virginia in 2019 and in Indianapolis last year during coronavirus. The, and, the, and the diaries that coincided with a number of these hotels where they stayed also documented. So they they found out all this new research based on this collection. So now we have the second largest Hopper collection in the world to the Whitney. And what that means is that it comes with a great deal of responsibility. So we've we've 
transcribed. Well, we, we have everything digitized for the most part, but what we're trying to do, and we actually got a grant for an intern this summer to come in and put this all together so that if someone wanted to look at our Hopper collections online, they would be able to do that. So it's really an incredible gift. And so now when people come and want to see the Hoppers, we're like, yes, we have hundreds of them. And the, and the disappointment factor has gone away. But this has really changed Pam in a lot of ways. Um, Hopper didn't come to Pam. He didn't like, there was only one thing I could find in the diaries where Joe says to him, why don't you put something in the jury show at the Provincetown Art Association? And he said, why would I do that? That was the answer. So we could go on and on and on. And that's a whole nother lecture for another time. But at any rate, this has really escalated this museum on, on many, many levels, especially um, scholarly um, research. Um, if you've ever been here, we, you know that we do lectures, we do programs, we do concerts, we do all kinds of things. We are not doing those this summer. We are doing lectures online. We are not having concerts this summer and we are doing smaller events either indoor, uh, outdoors or at somebody else's house. <laughs> but we, we're, we're gonna air to caution this year. Um, we still um, have, we're gonna have great shows up this summer and people will definitely be invited to come and look, but hopefully we will resume, resume our regularly frenetic schedule in 2022. Um, and one of the questions that people ask is how did we survive COVID? And one of the most essential areas for us was with our youth education. We work with schools and students all the way from Provincetown to Hyannis kids had a really, really hard time this year. And so as much as we were doing Zoom, we also were doing hikes in Beach Forest and hikes at um, Cedar Swamp and tried to do some field trips and get kids out of the house just to do something. And their parents were begging us to do classes. And this is a piece that one of our students created. Um, and we just had an exhibition of all the work they did during coronavirus, which was quite amazing. And this is a 16 year old girl who did this painting. And when I look at it, it just sums up what happened with our students and they were still able to persevere despite what happened during coronavirus. And so now we're already offering a number of youth education classes outdoors and we have waiting lists right now because kids need art more than anything. And I, and I think all of us do, and I think art, more than anything was recognized as just as essential as anything else during COVID. And with us, what I started to do is I started putting art in the big glass window in front and people would say, oh, I walk, take my walk every afternoon. When are you gonna change the artwork? So I started changing the artwork in the window. It was something as simple as that. But what other things we decided to do was start putting exhibitions online for people who still can't come to Provincetown and may not get here the summer because you can't find a room, I can tell you that much. So I'm gonna show you something that we've done on our website. I'm gonna stop this and, and pick up something else so that you can see, um, uh, let's see, where is this? Uh, hold on one second, here it is, hold on, okay. So what we did is we wrote another grant because we write a lot of grants here to do a 3D exhibition. So if you if you go to our website and you click on this, you can take a three-dimensional tour around Pam. You can go up to paintings, you can look at them, you can read the labels. I I pop up in a couple of them and talk about them, but this is what we did. So now we're basically doing two of everything. We're doing online exhibitions, in-person exhibitions, online classes, outdoor classes, online lectures. So we're really trying to keep everybody connected because for me, the two words that, that stayed the entire 2020 to stay relevant and to stay connected. And I've never picked up my landline right here. See, I actually have a landline phone more in 20 years than to just call people and, and ask them how they were doing or taking a walk with somebody or just, you know, very intimate as opposed to 400 person events, which we won't be doing this year. But it really made me rethink my role as a director and, and what's important and what, what do people really need. And I can't tell you that I probably got more thank yous than I ever have in 20 years for being open, for allowing people to come in and just look at artwork. But my favorite quote so far was, I used to always go to Pam to eat wine or drink wine and eat cheese. Now I go in and I just look at paintings and I actually read the labels. I was like, great. Now I'm never serving wine and cheese again. So you have to just come in and read the labels and look at the paintings. But it's been, it's been very gratifying for me to see people come in and feel safe in the space and feel 
happy about looking at artwork that, and, and what the other thing that we've done is we've actually started partnering with helping our women, the AIDS support group, the Alzheimer's Association of Cape Cod, and some other wellness gr groups to, to offer a wellness program on days that were close to the public. We're bringing groups in for people who literally haven't been out of their houses in a year to come in and just look at art. And it's been amazing. And I'm really proud of the work <clears throat> that we've done. And I'm hoping that we can continue these partnerships because like I said earlier, the collaboration piece is key. And like, this is the first time I'm doing something with Falmouth and I hope that we can do, do more because we're all in the same boat here and there was no manual for this, I can tell you. And so the idea of us being able to offer as much programming as we can on our shoestring budgets while losing $450,000 in revenue in 2020, it wasn't easy, but it challenged us in different ways I feel like we've come out stronger in a lot of ways, and I'm just really, really proud of, of what we did. And so that's basically it in a nutshell. And so let's see, how, how long did I just talk without taking a breath? 27, 27 minutes, no, an hour. <laughs> so I'll open it up to questions now for anybody who'd like to ask me any questions. So Chris, if you can do yeah. the end share, yep. then we can, there we go. Um, then we can okay. see everyone and we can, I'm going to remove the spotlight so we can look at if people are raising hands. Um, but thank you, Chris. That was amazing. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time <laughs> as a major, major fan of Provincetown thank you. and Pam. Um, so thank you for that. And looking around to see if we have questions for Chris. I'm <clears throat> going to start one out, Chris. And I didn't catch the name of the artist who did the amazing Cyclone Piece, oh, and I her, name to... was, her name was Catherine Widgery, okay. W-I-D-G-E-R-Y. And you know, what's, what's interesting is that people started just dropping boxes of stuff off at her studio in Truro, where Castle Hill is now at Edgewood Farm. That's where her studio used to be. And people would just start bringing her boxes of things when they saw her creating this cyclone. And it was really a fun project. That is very cool. Yeah. Um, other questions for Chris? I think Jane Looking around, yes, I see. Um, I have it. Jane has a question. You have to Whoops. unmute yourself, Jane. You're still on mute. Whoops, you're still, you went on to mute again. <laughs> now you're off mute. I have a teacher uh, at Mount Holyoke. His name was Edward Corbett. Sure. And I would dearly love to see the painting he did in Provincetown. Edward Corbett? Yeah. Okay. Could I come and come and see that paint? Um, yeah, you'd have to make an appointment with us because um, we're still kind of being safe. But Jim Zimmerman, I'm sure, would be happy to pull it for you. Just give us a call, Jane. So that was a very specific question. Other yeah. questions, Christina. <clears throat> um, our son lived in Provincetown for a number of years at the property that used to be called the Hawthorne School, the barn you were talking about. Yeah. And um, his the family that he stayed with was Peter G's family. Mm -hmm. Do you have paintings of Peter G in the? Your we car? actually, um, I think we have. We might have one. We were actually talking about doing a show of Peter's work, mm -hmm. but. Olga has, has, isn't, isn't that well. So that's right, still, that, yeah. still a possibility, but I've seen his work before and it's really quite, quite extraordinary. Yeah. My son actually has a piece and yeah. um, I framed it for him because I thought it was kind of cool that he had it. <laughs> yeah. He helped him with something and they gave it to him. Yeah. Really very interesting family. Mm. <laughs> yeah. The kids, the kids used to take classes here all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I just was curious. Sure. Other questions for Chris? Other questions? And I, it was unusual that Peter G ended up with the Hawthorne barn. I remember I did run, talk to the family and that was somehow they, they got it and then they did sell it. Yep. Do you know the details of that at all? How he um, had been a student <clears throat> or of? I, I don't know the def the details of how they acquired the barn. I know more about the details of them selling it, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my son was part of trying to save it. They were like on this campaign to save the Hawthorne School. <laughs> the people who own it now, they do let 20 summers 
rent yep. it for a month. Is that right? And yeah, they, in the month of June. Um, it's like uh, end of May to mid June or something. But they do, yeah, allow them to program. And they've allowed us to do programs in there as well. They're very, very generous. It's also an Airbnb, so you could actually rent it and sleep in it. It's a really, really cool space. Other questions for Chris? Looking around and seeing people can put things. Oh, there is something in the chat. Excuse me. Yeah. So fantastic to learn about Pam. Thank um, you. Is a, is a comment for you. Other questions? Um, and seeing none, I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up. I All mean, right. I, that was just so great. And Thank I know you. I certainly w was there and saw the the, the big art, the large art show and the acquisitions um, and also the um, part two of the Nappy collection, yeah. I think. So right now we have part three up. We have um, our Lillian Orlowski and William Fried grant recipients. We have a really great show of Bunny Perlman up. And then next week we install Double Bloom, which is Joan Snyder and Rebecca Hutchinson uh, to promote our garden tour, which we don't know how we're doing that quite yet this year, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> So always lots to see yes. at Pam and it's just, a, it's a beautiful facility um, Thank you. And to walk in. And it is, it is the largest space for art on Cape Cod. There's no question about that. Yeah. So I hope you all go visit. And Chris, thank you so much. Oh, My I pleasure. see a question. It's, there's always one on the way out here. Connie. Yes. yes. Hi, um, do you have Herman Merrill paintings? Oh God, yes. Good. Lots of them. I actually, I've curated a number of Herman Merrill shows. I'm, I'm actually on the board of the Herman Merrill Foundation. I am the biggest Herman Merrill freak you've ever met. And I, his son is a very, very dear friend of mine. And I, I love his work so much. I can't even begin to tell you. <laughs> okay. I, I bought a, a print in Wellfleet one year. And then I saw that the original was going to be shown at Pam, and that yeah. was my first introduction to Pam. So. Oh, his work is just exquisite, and his story is really great too. It's wonderful. Yeah, I'll I'll yeah. come talk to you some more. Good. Thank you. Another comment. So awesome! Can't wait to visit soon. Yay! So I know we all love to go up to Provincetown from Falmouth. It is a drive, but well, well worth it. Well worth it. Any other questions? I think that's that's all we have for tonight. So great. thank you so much, Chris. Thank you Wonderful so much. Talk. It was my pleasure. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.